Okay, let's give this a go. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Sunrise Safari. Seems as though our audio issues are sorted out. Luckily for us, the Sunrise provided something beautiful to look at whilst we tried to sort out all the problems that we were experiencing. But good morning, my name is Jamie. I have Dave on camera with me, and we're off on a search of the eastern boundary to see if maybe Tingana might have brought Tandi along for a visit. He was with her yesterday on Torchwood, so the property to the east of us. Not too far away at all, and in fact, I think Brent heard him calling right at the end of yesterday's sunset safari. So that is my plan as it stands for our drive this morning. That being said, nothing ever goes exactly according to plan out here. <laughs> our Indiana James has said that it looks as though with our cloudy start, that Brent and myself might be needing our blankies this morning. Actually, luckily for us, the clouds have actually insulated the earth this morning, and because they're not really rain clouds or thick or heavy and low, it's warmer than it has been recently. So it's 23 degrees centigrade, which is 73 Fahrenheit. Not chilly at all. Well, not as chilly as it has been recently. I've still got my jacket on. 23 degrees is winter temperatures for us. Now don't forget, because I don't know if Brent was able to tell you this, but if you're joining us for the first time, you can send through questions to our show on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions on wildearth.tv. We love to hear from you. Co questions or comments, all good. And we're coming to you live from Juma and Arasuza Game Reserves in the Sabi Sands in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. I've got a funny feeling you might lose me through this dip, which is why I'm crawling at snail speed as we continue along. We're just going down the other side of a crest. And Wendy's been a little bit sick when it comes to signal. We've been sticking to the western edge of Juma. I thought perhaps it was the day to push the boundaries and just see if maybe it's fear of lacking, of fear of losing signal rather than actually losing signal. Let's see how we go, but just in case I do lose you, let's jump on the back of Brent's vehicle. So we're back in that area where we think Karula might have a kill and no tracks yet. And we are checking very carefully. It's a little bit more difficult to see tracks in the dark. So that's why I'm going very slowly. And uh, every now and then you'll notice me put the spotlight off the side of the vehicle and hold it down the road like that. And that's so I can throw a shadow if I think I see a track. And just to make sure we don't miss anything. I think it is going to be quite a spectacular morning, even though it is quite a few quite a lot of cloud around. It all looks quite low and fluffy, and I think it's going to burn off as the sun gets higher. Oh, I hear something interesting. I can hear a bird calling down towards the... There we go, Mawati. Very wonderful fluid chortle. Now, that is the robin chat we saw for the first time on live drives a few days ago. It is the white throated robin chat. So, we definitely, when it gets a bit lighter, we know which area they're in. Well, let's go see if we can get them on camera for a second time. Maybe a bit better of a view this time. Armchair Traveller says, congratulations, Wild Earth and Safari Live. We have over 8,000 followers or subscribers on YouTube. 
And that is incredible if I think how much we have grown in the short time that I've been here. How does that make you feel, Vim? Nice. Nice, Vim. Nice. One word, one word answer from Vim. Not warm and fuzzy, just nice. Okay. Vim, a man of many camera talents, but not many words when he's on the back of the vehicle. Oh, morning, early Franklin. So now, if Kruda does have a kill or a den on Juma, and a kill or a den on the property to the south of us, she's gonna be traversing up and down. So there's a good chance you can catch her on the move, moving between these two spots. Let's see, I'm just checking the tracks. And uh, either way, it's very good for us to know which is which. So if she does have a den here, we can zone the area. But we, it is getting to that very exciting time when those little cubs are going to be about two months old and they're going to be able to climb trees and that so we are possibly going to start viewing them and now this all depends on the circumstances and we'll only be able to make that call once we see them if we still feel they're a bit young a bit nervous a bit jumpy or she's a bit upset uh, we'll again immediately zone that area but it is very exciting times Washington says, well, if Karula was patrolling her territory in scent marking, how close would we have to be to the scent mark to smell it if it was very fresh? Probably within about 10 to 15 meters. Obviously, our sense of smell is not nearly as developed as a leopard. Uh, it's one of our senses that has slowly become less and less developed the more we evolve, uh, the more we rely on our brain and our verbal communication. We haven't had to rely on smells as much. So we'd have to be quite close. So our plan from here is we're going to check up towards Weaver's Nest and then we'll check through to the southern boundary and we'll check very carefully along the southern boundary. If there, we can't find any tracks crossing out in that general area, I think we'll head a little bit further east. Right before the end of the sunset safari, we did have uh, audio of a, a leopard rasping and I think that was Tangano who was found to the east of us. And he might be on his patrol and he might be moving back towards Juma. So there are options this morning. I think it's definitely worth really checking this area properly before we move on. Now Tangana, most male leopards can walk incredible distance. I mean, a few days ago, I think Tindana did a good 12 or 13 kilometer stroll uh, before resting up in Torchwood. And he did that overnight. It's not impossible, but it's normally you don't find them moving more than about four or five kilometers in a night. But sometimes, specifically with males, and that goes for both lion and leopard, if they're on a mission, they're on a mission.
is quite interesting. I'm not quite sure. I can't really see it nicely. It looks like a possible drag mark here, but it's a bit dark still. Just trying to make sure it's not elephants. Or an ant run. OK, well, I think I'm going to have to come back here when it's a little bit lighter. I'm not going to walk in this half light just yet. Uh, my eyes are not quite where they should be to go into a thick, thick area like that. So I'm going to do a loop around and then come back and check that possible drag. You can just look with the spotlight in the trees quickly down in the drainage. Just double checking. Now, leopards will hoist. Not always, though. If they feel there's not too much of a threat of losing their kill to hyenas or lions, they might leave it on the ground for a while, or if it's a bit of a big kill for them. Now, that definitely wasn't there last uh, on the Sunset Safari. And I can tell you with, with a fact, Karula definitely wasn't in this particular block here because uh, I did check every decent tree for a leopard to put a kill in, and I, I, I did walk that whole little drainage system. I only saw two sets of tracks. The ground is very hard at the moment. Now, B. Wilson has picked up on some very exciting news. In the near future, we'll be extending our traverse zone and we'll be adding cheetah planes to it. And she would like to know, are there any particular animals I'm looking forward to seeing down there? Well, there's quite a few. So hopefully, by the time all the antennas and everything is set up, uh, Quarantine and Kunuma will still be out about in that area. It could have moved, as it does happen with young male leopards. They could have moved further on, but fingers crossed. Also, uh, very exciting to just traverse a new area and uh, on right on the gabbro soil, so much more open grasslands. So we do, we do get quite a few more cheetah sightings in that area. By no means every day, but you do have the opportunity to see cheetah a little bit more often. So I'm quite excited about that. And then there's a couple of different leopards. Uh, one I haven't seen before who seems to be setting up territory in that area. And that is one of Karula's past kids, Shavambalan the male leopard and also of course great to see uh, Tandi also is seen in that area quite frequently as well as on the eastern side uh, in Kanyanin so, and she's got two cubs probably about three and a half four months now so I have seen those but very very exciting nonetheless And the Birmingham boys spend a lot of time there compared to Juma. So there's always that. And the Styx lioness also seem to spend more time there. So there's a whole host of other species, or not species, other individuals or potential characters that we can start wearing on. So I walked that whole block looking for a kill in a tree, and she'd like to know how heavy a kill can a leopard put in a tree. Well, making it again depends on the leopard. A big male leopard like Tingana can probably put a small kudu up a tree, but uh, a small female like Karula will battle with an adult female in parlor. So I figure she's probably going to put up a tree straight away as a as a young young a young impala, a sub-adult, but 
it all just depends. So they can generally lift, well, in Karina's case, probably about her own body weight or even a bit more. So I wasn't only looking for a kill in a tree. The reason I went sneaking through that drainage system or little river system was to see if she was possibly, not possibly keeping uh, her cubs in there. So we're looking for both a kill or a den, one of the two. So we're now on the southern edge of the traverse, so I'm going to be going very slowly and asking VM to keep an eye out as well. Oh, what have we found? That looks... You do find strange things out in the bush. Vim, do you need a, a, new, a new item for your, your motor car? Uh. But Vim really loves his car and he keeps adding to it. And uh, I don't think we're going to find the owner of this, but it's very shiny. And Vim seems to like shiny things. Maybe not. I don't think you want headlight. this one. I think this is uh, from a headlight that's popped off someone's car. But I just saw the shiny thing and like a crow, I was attracted to it, but there we go, Vim, it's for you. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> okay, where are my ears going? There they are. So we do find strange things sometimes. Um, cell phones, cameras, hats, jerseys. I picked up a camera. Before. Yes, Vim picked up a camera this year. Um, so all sorts of funny things. We generally do try return them to their owners, but sometimes their owners have left or we can't find the owners. Now, I think possibly one of the strangest things I found on, on the safari was an electric toothbrush. <laughs> Not exactly something you expect to find while tracking animals through the bush. We keep checking carefully around here. Let's go see what Jamie's up to. And see how many strange vehicle objects Brent can find in the bush. Is that instant moment when you hear something like that, that you start to worry about what it is you might have bashed off your vehicle. And if it was in fact something that came from Wendy, but we seem to be all intact, thank goodness. I've definitely found some very, very strange things in the bush, some of which are fairly unmentionable. Otherwise, some that are fairly conventional, especially we used to do a river cleanup every dry season where we'd go through the river and pick up the rubbish that had washed through in the floods from the previous rainy season. And goodness me, but we used to have a, we used to play what was known as river cleanup bingo. Everybody had different cards, and it was, this is with my, with my guests. They would have different cards with things like shoes, or nappies, or beer bottle, or, you, you, you get the idea. Placemats, I found a lot of placemats after the lodge flooded. Lamps, bedside lamps. And what else did we find a lot of? Plastic and debris and stuff. That happens after major floods occur, and the river washes everything downstream. We did go and clean up very carefully. Now, I just want to check the tracks that are next to me. I think it's hyena. I know that Brent was chatting a little bit to you about the prospect of cheetah planes, which, of course, we are all exceptionally excited about. Oh, speaking of Brent, he just wants to chat to me quickly. Standing by. I'm on Cheetah Cup Line, close to Bookles Junction. Brent just checking in, wanting to make sure that we don't end up checking the same areas. But yes, Brent was talking a bit about the prospect of to the Cheetah Plains Traverse and the possibility of cheetah. Now, there were those two male cheetah on in coral yesterday afternoon. And I'm really, or close to Cheetah Plains, actually, and I'm really hoping that in future, 
might be seeing them. But I'm also here to check and see every now and again those males use this cut line as a highway up further to the north and back towards Manioleti. Now, fingers crossed they might decide to do that this morning. It would be terribly convenient, and that's why I'm checking these hyena tracks as carefully as possible, because cheetah tracks and hyena tracks, if you're looking quickly, it can look quite similar because you see the claw marks in both of those tracks. Cheetah, of course, having the three lobes on the back of their pad. They're roughly the same size for, depending on the size of your hyena, but the cheetah track, of course, having the three lobes at the back as opposed to the hyena. And then, of course, the most important thing to look for is the cheetah walk fairly sort of straight, so their back right foot will fall where their front right foot was, and vice versa, whereas hyenas do that crosswalk. So front right falls, back left falls close to it. I would show you, but the light I don't think is terribly good just yet for that. And I will demonstrate or show you a clear example as, we, as it gets a little bit lighter. I have a feeling that those animals in the road are just my imagination, but I'm just gonna check quickly. just my imagination. This cheetah cut line gets me every time. Good morning, Virginia. You were wondering whether or not we will see animals that we don't usually see on Juma at Cheetah Plains, and the answer is yes, there is a distinctive possibility that that will be the case. We don't often see, there won't be anything that is impossible for us to see here, if that makes sense, because it's unfenced and animals have legs, so they could come straight through to us, but it is a much better environment for animals like cheetah, as we mentioned. Secretary birds is also a distinctive possibility, that roan, ah, uh, not that roan, sorry, that sable antelope that appeared once very briefly on Juma was um, seen fairly regularly on the Encoral camera, which is very close to the Cheetah Plains side of, or side of the border. Okay, we're going to take a detour and go and check Buffalo's Hook Dam. No sign of Tingana crossing just yet either, but my suspicion will be that if he does cross, he will cross further to the south. I'm guessing that just because of the presence of this male we've nicknamed Pijima, the skittish male leopard that's been seen around this area a couple of times. He's not used to vehicles at all, but he is a fairly large leopard, not larger than Tingana, but he is fairly large, and I imagine that Tingana and Pijima will attempt to stay out of each other's way. But with leopards, as, as our regular viewers know, you never know where they're going to turn up. It's what makes live safaris so exciting. A very good morning, Aqua. Um, I'm actually, you know, I gave that update yesterday that Shadow, oh, that Tundi and Tingana were mating yesterday. They were seen together around Tingana's kill. But I spoke to the other guides and they didn't see them getting around to mating. But what that might mean is they're just at the courtship stage of the relationship. So she might be an estrus. Hello, Elephants. Good morning. How are we today? Are we in a good mood or are we in a grumpy mood? Hello, gorgeous. They're going to come right towards us, I think. We're just going to sit here and let them come to us. What are you doing? Oh, it's you. It's you, you crazy thing. 
I'm sure this is the crazy elephant that did this to me last time here. Yeah? He likes to show off from the <laughs> Oh, that is too cute. Hey? What are you doing, you crazy thing? This isn't the same elephant that did this to me the last time, but nevertheless putting on such a show for us. Aren't we so lucky? It's <laughs> playing like a puppy. You're having a great time, little one. I'm almost certain that's a male calf, just by that behavior. Hello, guys. Good morning. Yes, little one. Are you going to come say hello? Or are you done now? You done playing? Little one, just about a year old, maybe a bit older. So still very, very young. And I'm just going to be quiet for a moment so you can hear them moving about on either side of us. I know. It's okay. I promise you, I'm not any kind of a threat to you. And you're very big and scary. Enjoy a peaceful elephant sighting like this. Hello, Mommy. Dad, can you reach in and just turn my headlights off, please? No big girl. Actually, no, just wait. Just let her come past. Hello, little one. Sorry. Sorry about that. Not very nice, is it? Yes, little one. Oh, you're so scary. Hello, beautiful. You're a big girl. You're a very big, very pregnant girl. Okay. Yeah, if you can, please. Thank you very much. Got a tree on your head.
Let me see if I can the floor. The smooth back. I absolutely am so in love with this female. She is too beautiful. She is absolutely huge. She really is enormous and she is so pregnant. Old Jim Belly. She's extraordinary. We are so incredibly fortunate to enjoy a moment like that. And the smell of them has just completely surrounded us. And that's why I'm speaking very softly, not because we need to be scared, but because They've chosen to come right up past us. It's such a special feeling. And I just wanted to let us all enjoy it in silence. You'll notice every now and again, I'm just checking behind me. It is actually quite a, it's a very large herd that's moving through here. There's another large female at the back. But you can see if you compare her stomach to the one before, how different she looks. She might be pregnant, but she's not nearly as pregnant as that female that we were watching. Raisa, I couldn't agree with you more. It, these magic moments are such a privilege and it's always a pleasure to be able to share this with you. This is what makes Safari Live special. It's these moments that we absolutely, as guides, fall in love with. And it's made even more special by our ability to share it with you all. A huge breeding herd probably, I would say, at least 30 animals, probably more. Now, I'm not turning on the vehicle just yet. We're going to let them move slightly past us before we do. <laughs> what you got in your mouth, little one? Absolutely. Janet Jones. We were watching that little elephant calf, and it reminded Janet of, that, of the capacity that elephants have to have fun. There's an old female at the back there. Oh, who's you? <laughs> Janet, I actually think the babies enjoy having us around. I really honestly do. I think it provides them with entertainment where they might otherwise be a bit bored with um, constantly feeding and nobody to play with. We're just a little bit of extra entertainment. And those moments are incredibly special. I've had a sighting on this road with three young males playing together that was absolutely extraordinary, rolling around on top of each other on a termite mount. And these are truly special times. It's also it's a reminder of just how intelligent these animals are. The ability to play and to learn is so clear in them. Even just watching them, the youngsters with their uncoordinated trunks, it's like watching toddlers learning to grab things and to draw and to hold a pen. All of those things, part of their learning experience. Christopher, in terms of how old an elephant is when it learns to use its trunk, and when it finally learns to use its trunk, it's only, it only takes them a couple of months by... Oh, what's happening back there? There's two, two sparring boys. So Christopher, it will take them a couple of months. I will reposition when I can, which will be fairly soon. Most of them have moved out of my way. 
but it will take them a couple of years to get as fully coordinated as the adults. And again, just like toddlers, that is determined by the individual personality of the elephant concerned. So children learn things at different paces, so do elephants. And some ellies are just naturally clumsier than others. And some don't ever grow out of that. I certainly didn't grow out of my clumsiness. And some elephants are the same. And you get to know them really well. He's <laughs> completely, I almost want to say submerged, it's the wrong word, but completely surrounded by the sicklebush tree. Sicklebush have the most horrible thorns, and yet his skin impervious to it. Okay, we can reposition now, you should be able to. I'm just checking around me. It's just a gracious that was that was exceptionally loud <laughs> little male just giving me a talking to as I drive away from him naughty boy so here and Louis the lion are just saying that they appreciate the silencing moments like that and it is very important especially when elephants choose to come to you when they choose that path it's important that you respect that. Now, I, I talk fairly regularly to the elephants, just communicating my intentions through my tone rather than through my words. And that's where a little bit of time spent with elephants is very important. And I have spent many, many hours with them. They're one of my favorite animals and probably my f absolute favorite animal to spend time with. Hello, boy. What was that all about, you cheeky thing? That was a very scary trumpet. And your mom's just ignored you. The rest of the herd have just ignored you completely. So this, this teenager that trumpeted at us, he's a young male of, and I called him a teenager, he's probably about 10 or so, maybe even a little bit older. So he's at that, at that age where now he's getting start, he was starting to get pushed more and more to the fringes of the herd. And very soon he will be off on his own in the next few years, which is a scary experience for a little male elephant. Oh, that's interesting. Dave, the female at the back there, I know her. That is, I think, oh no, sorry. My mistake. Yes, it is her, the female with only one tusk. There's a few of them around, but I recognize this, the age of this elephant. I'm fairly certain it's the same one. Now, she obviously broke off that right tusk at some point in her life. Here you go. Just the tusk on the left. And she's quite an old girl. You see how her skull, how prominent the bones are of her skull? And very often the older females do spend a bit of time at the back of the herd. They have to take a bit longer to chew because their teeth are starting to wear down. And although the herd won't abandon them, they do fall behind fairly regularly. What a beautiful sighting. Look at that, you can see she's old. You can actually see it. Just like us, their skin loses elasticity and their, their subcutaneous level of fat reduces. So you get the, the sort of the clearer bones around the face and the skull. Is that an elephant lying down? Yes, little elephant having a nap at the back. Beautiful, beautiful sighting. Shame, I'm calling her old. She's probably about 40. Mario, who is seven years old, is astounded at just how big an elephant really is. Mario wanted to know, do elephants ever step on snakes? 
And Mario, yes, sometimes, but not often. So even though, imagine having a giant nose, a nose so big that you can't see underneath it. That's how an elephant sees. They can't see underneath, straight underneath their face or underneath by their feet unless they put their heads right down. So they could step on snakes, but at the same time, they've got such a good sense of smell and an idea of the world around them that it hardly ever happens. Beautiful. Thank you for your question, Mario. Let's go. We'll just follow slowly behind. I wouldn't mind a chance to get in front of them, but obviously we don't want to overstay our welcome. They're not, they haven't moved off yet though. We'll be able to stick with them for a little bit longer. Mm, that smell is such a lovely way to start the day. It's such a gentle, grassy smell. And just like that, several hundred tons of animal has disappeared, melted away into the bush. Now, Alice, who is watching in Ohio, good morning, just chatting a bit about how large elephants really are, was saying that she, it amazes her that elephants stay so large eating just grass and trees, and how on earth does that happen? Um, Alice, one of the, the most important things is in order to maintain that body weight, the elephants eat constantly. They hardly, they don't sleep as nearly as much as we do. They'll doze for a couple of minutes each day, but they'll feed all the way through the day and all the way through the night. The only exception being the babies because they've got mommy's milk to feed on. But at the same time, by the way, they are still here. I'm just finding us a nice place to stop and view them. At the same time, if they were carnivores, can you imagine how much they would have to eat? Because generally you'll find there's energy loss as you move down the food chain. So herbivores get more energy out of the sugars of the plants and predators get less energy out of the meat from their prey. But at the same time, herbivores can eat constantly because there's a food source that's available to them. Imagine a predatory elephant. It would be terrifying. So they are getting the carbohydrates that they need from the trees that they're feeding on and by constantly eating. But what fascinates me, Alice, is how ineffective their digestive systems really are. So an adult elephant can consume up to 300 kilograms of food per day. That's over 600 pounds worth. And it will excrete or defecate out about a third, if not more, of that un food completely undigested. So it is really interesting how that works and how actually inefficient their digestive systems really are. Senior Gold, having spoken about the fact that one adult elephant can consume, what is that baby doing again? Is it trying? To, is it just trying to have a nap? Different little one from earlier, I think, but nevertheless, sitting down on its bottom. What are you doing, little thing? Are you sleepy? Yes, very sleepy. And see the, oh, no, maybe not, maybe not. All right, everybody's moving. I guess I better get up, but all I want to do is have a nap. Now I'm gonna feel all cranky. Oh, <laughs> shame. That's pretty much how I felt this morning, to be completely honest. I usually bound out of bed, but this morning was a bit more of a struggle. Sorry, Senior Gold, we were just talking about elephants feeding and you were wondering how fast a plant or plant life regenerates and recedes. 
since it astounds you that with all the herbivore activity, we still have as much plants, plant life as we do. There's a couple really interesting points on that. First of all, elephants move constantly as they feed. And the reason that they do that, so I'm going to reposition so we can have a look at these two youngsters fighting. There's a bull off to our left, who's quite young still. Oh, there's actually more of a herd off to our right, sorry. I've got my lefts and my rights confused. I'm going to stop here just so we can watch the watch playtime while I answer Celia Gold's question. So, elephants move constantly as they feed. One of the biggest reasons behind that is that the trees around them, not just the trees that they're feeding on, but those around them as well, are releasing a substance known as tannins that make the trees particularly bitter to feed on. And once those tannins, once a tree has started releasing those tannins as a defense mechanism, they also release a pheromone that inspires the surrounding trees in the area to start producing and releasing tannins as well. And what that does is it ensures that an area is not overgrazed or overfed on by the animal life. And that applies for all animals, not just elephants. These two are having a great time <laughs> bulldozing each other. Oh, mock mounting, display of dominance. And there's also the fact that this ecosystem is entirely dependent on the action of the herbivores. Now, we are understanding more and more the interconnectedness of everything that happens or occurs here. Elephants evolved with the grass and the trees that they live in. And as a result, they're actually an essential part of maintaining this very delicate balance that is a savanna ecosystem. The trees and the grass have to be in a very sort of specific amount in order to survive. That's one of the reasons why fire can be so important and regular burning can be fairly important. I'm not talking every year, but every couple of years. What the elephants do is they ensure that the trees don't actually block out the... They don't actually block out the, the, the grass completely. Too many trees, you've got no grass. Too much grass, you've got no... You've got no space for, although generally too much grass doesn't really occur. But you can get an idea of what I mean. That herbivore activity and that hoof activity has actually evolved alongside this ecosystem to keep the grass growing. A herd of buffalo moving through will move almost constantly, graze an area, and then not return to it for quite a long period of time. The difference where that doesn't always work, or where that theory doesn't always work, is something we've spoken about fairly regularly about man-made water holes or man-made dams. And we'll see it more and more in the drought, both on natural water sources and around man-made dams, that you will get top set, or grass and trees being completely mown through because the animals are hungry, but they also want to drink. And as a result, the top, sail, top soil layer will start to erode. So that's the damage that this drought is going to do to the ecosystem itself. And it, in that situation, senior gold, to actually get back to the question we're asking, the regenerative properties of the ecosystem are still there, but might take a couple of years to recover rather than a couple of days. Well, the trees regenerate fairly quickly. And yes, occasionally elephants do kill trees. If they've ring barked them completely, so stripped the bark away, or if perhaps they have opened up the bark layer in order for wood borers and other such parasites to enter into the trees. Clayton, just to go back to a point I made earlier that you missed, you were wondering about how many pounds of food a day. There's our lovely old girl. Not the best view, but it is, it is the view that we're going to stick with. And keep an eye on the ones that are moving about on my right as well. They're very far into the block. They're sort of walking parallel with me. Clayton was just wondering how many pounds of food an elephant will eat. He missed it. The answer is over six, for a big elephant, so let's say a big bull or a big cow, over 600 pounds of food consumed in 24 hours. That's an enormous amount. And then what would that be? About 200 pounds of that is excreted as 
done. A tremendous amount of wastage that actually happens in, if we think of it in those terms. But obviously we can't. Uh, the more, the older the elephant gets, the more inefficient their chewing becomes. We've spoken a lot about the fact that elephants have six sets of molars in their lives. And once they reach the end of the sixth set, that has worn down, there are no more tree, te teeth to replace that, and they start to struggle to chew. And so they don't digest as efficiently as younger elephants do. And that's what actually gives rise to the stories about elephant graveyards. Because what happens is elephants move to where, the, when they get very old, before the end of their lives, they will move to a riverbed where there are soft reeds and soft food for them to eat with more nutrition. And they will eventually die of old age and various complications relating to their lack of condition because they can't chew. And they'll die and what will happen is there'll be a big flood that will wash their bones into corners of riverbeds where they will settle along flood lines and that has given rise to the rumor that elephants go to a specific place to die. They don't. It just happens to... That's just how the process has come to give rise to that rumor. Okay, we've got most of our eddies off the road now. I'm just seeing if we can go ahead of them and wait for them to come to us. Cindy, that elephants walk, their front and the way that they place their front legs is so powerful and yet so quiet at the same time. I completely understand what you mean. I also really enjoy watching elephants walk and I watch, I love watching as their foot lands, the way that that spongy tissue expands and absorbs the weight of the creature. I mean, I mean you just think about how big those must be, how strong they must be and how it dissipates the weight and makes them so incredibly quiet it is a wonderful thing to observe. I'm going to try and loop ahead of our lovely herd of elephants. Let's see if they don't come out on the other side of the block. While I do that, let's get an update from Brent. So we have not been able to find a single leopard track. That drag mark turned out not to be a drag mark. Morning, so we are leaving that area for now and we're going to go see what's happening in the west so first we're going to check down towards the boundary of Arethesa and Juma and go into the western channel see if there's any updates on Arethesa and other than that we're just going to go fiddle about see what we can find A report that male leopard that I heard calling last night uh, was a Tingana, but unfortunately he went further south away from Juma instead of into Juma. But he's on his patrol, so he should be back in a day or two. And we will be definitely keeping an eye out for him. And I'm not sure. The Birminghams were last seen on the Kruger Park boundary uh, with Buffalo's Hook. I know there's some people going to have a look around there this morning, see if they can find them. So if they do find them, I will keep you updated, or Jamie will at least. And the wonderful thing is no one's seen the wild dogs for a day or two. No tracks, no nothing, so who knows, maybe they'll pop, pop into Juma to say hello. So it is mating season for the wild dogs at the moment. And uh, they will be starting to excavate and check potential den sites. Uh, the main reason we're checking along here is we did follow Shadow's tracks for a very long time yesterday. I'm wondering if she pops out of that 
safari donga or drainage or little riverbed again. So this safari donga, as it's called, or it's a little dry riverbed, is one of fa uh, Shadow's favorite areas for keeping cubs. Uh, let's hope she is a little bit more successful uh, with this next litter than she has been with her past litters. So there's a lot of excitement uh, when our Cheetah Plans Travis comes through. Very, very exciting stuff. It will be fascinating to explore a slightly different area of the Savi Sands with slightly different geology and soil type. Leanne would like to know, do they have ostriches at Cheetah Plains and are they comfortable with vehicles? I've never seen one on the live safari. It is a possibility of all the places that we're most likely to see an ostrich. It would be on Cheetah Plains because of the soil types. There's more open grass in there and they, they do prefer that. But again, we're probably only going to see them during the very dry months. And whether they're comfortable with vehicles or not, we'll have to wait to find out. Quite a few buffalo across the road here. Some old Duggar boys. And looking at the tracks is like finding out who was out and about last night. So far, no one we're particularly interested in looking at just yet. Lots of hyena tracks, lots of Ellie tracks, and lots of buffalo tracks so far along with some of the smaller nocturnal stuff like civets, genets. So one of the reasons I like to get out in these main access roads early to check for tracks is before the road becomes busy and uh, vehicles potentially drive over the tracks, which makes it a lot harder for us to find them. Oh, apparently young Connor the carnival says he thinks he heard something die outside final control. Now, I'm going to ask you, Connor, what did it sound like? Did it sound something like this? Or uh, are you hearing elephants fighting? So, Connor, did it sound like that before I rushed towards final control? Apparently, there are some alarm calls as well. a lot of different noises and quite often people might think it is the distress call of something being killed by a predator but it is very distinct sound so I am driving a little bit faster just in case there is murder and mayhem happening back at final control. Okay, 
So Connor's not 100% sure. There were elephants in that area. But uh, Connor, can you, those sounds I made, did it sound anything like that? Okay, he was outside. Um, so, Connor, did it sound anything like this? Or a little bit more high pitched? Okay, so apparently Connor says it didn't sound anything like that. It sounded like something a cross between a growling, an elephant and a buffalo, I mean a lion and a buffalo or something like that. So I'm gonna go with, I'm 95% sure that it was an elephant. As I said, elephants have such a wide variety of calls, and if you're hearing any form of growling, um, I mean, it's very un unusual for it to be lions. I mean, lions will be a and leopard also, similar to that if they're fighting with something. And again, it's not gonna be that loud that you're gonna be hearing from far away. But whereas elephants, their screams, growls, oh, there's such a huge amount of different sounds an elephant can make. So I will go investigate, but I, I am going to investigate this road first because I can see someone tracking up ahead. So I'm going to go get an update from there. And I think they could be tracking Madame Shadow, who we're looking for. Or maybe the Inca Womans have decided uh, to pay us another visit. No one has a clue where they disappeared to. And they haven't been seen in the north or the south, but the last time they were very far west, the last tracks I had. We're heading out of Arethusa towards Elephant Plains. Oh! Speak of elephant. Well, you can already see that one's not relaxed. Running across the road, it was a female. So, she is not very relaxed at all. We're not going to stay with her. I'm going to keep going. Just go past slowly. We don't want to drive fast and incite a possible chase. I think maybe she just got a little fright as we came down the road. And these Ellie's look quite relaxed, but I just want to go up ahead and, and chat. Hello, lady. Yeah, they're not 100% not relaxed. They're backing away as we come past. Uh, we'll leave them be for now. I just want to get an update from this vehicle that's coming down the road, and then I will go check what is happening around Final Control and the Juma Dad Cat. So this could be a little bit of a long conversation, so uh, let's maybe jump across to Jamie, if she's ready. Morning, Uncle Tristan. Hello, everyone. How are you? How are you? So we're going to jump across to Jamie while I do a quick update with Tristan. So we'll see you just now. Now I hear that you have been listening to some strange sounds on the Dream and Dam camera. So I'm on my way to go and investigate. Hello, ladies. I just stopped for a herd of Inyala that we see fairly regularly on this road. I'm still a little bit far away. Sorry, just listening to the game drive comms. Okay. So, exciting stuff potentially happening around the Juma Dam. I was just thinking about it as I was driving along. Now, we're far away, but our elephant herd could probably hear exactly what was going on there. And I just wonder what they must think when they hear stuff like that and how they perceive it and interpret it. Our Inyala don't seem too phased, although they probably heard it as well with their extraordinary radar-like ears. 
I'm just gonna let them cross the road in front of me and then we'll move on and we'll carry on on our way towards the Juma Dam and see if we can't figure out what's happening there. That's lovely. A whole herd's going to come across this and youngsters as well. We've seen this herd with the males playing before, just like our baby elephants, dashing about like there's an obstacle course. And off you go. Now, Nyala are interesting animals. You get, you will see babies at all times of the year. And they are not like in parlor where they have a specific breeding season. I've seen babies born in midwinter. I've seen babies born in midsummer. So the constant flow of hormones keeps them very, uh, keeps them as very interesting animals because you will always have a chance to see the males displaying for the attentions of the ladies and to scare away other males. Hello. They do that incredible slow motion dance that Inyala are so famous for and that you don't see any of the other antelope doing to quite the same degree. For various animal movements, we might So, our morning meeting over. Uh, apologies for the gremlins with Jamie. So there were tracks of uh, what looks like shadow uh, around there, but they went back into Sibambili, but they might come out into Arethusa. So I'm gonna go check what this mysterious noise at final control. I'm still quite convinced it was the elephants, but uh, we will go check to keep everyone happy. And then I'll head back towards those leopard tracks. wondering about uh, another leopard we'll possibly get to see when we are uh, on Cheetah Plains. Tandi, we have seen her mating with Tingana. And Tandi, for those who don't know, is from Karula's first litter and Shadow's litter mate, so Shadow's sister. And Aqua is wondering where is her territory in comparison uh, to the other two, to Shadow and Karula. So, um, let me think of the best way to show you. Aqua, just give me half a second. But we are making our way back down towards final control. And uh, we should get some clarity on what was making that incredible noise that everyone heard. It's not on this one yet. That's why I can't find it. Yeah. Okay. So I there we have... The white is where we traverse at the moment. So Shadow's territory is pretty much from there up to the... the into the green, up to the, up to the, the boundary fence and down, around, and like that. Karula's territory from the boundary of shadows does this. And she has the whole of Juma, apart from this little western section where shadow comes, and into Torchwood there, and then down into little Gauri, and then borders with shadow again in the west. Tandi is from this bottom section here and further to the east, so around here. So 
the three largest territories in our area are all inhabited by Karula and her kids. So she hasn't had too many female cubs. So those two from her first litter have set up territory adjacent to Queen Karula. Now, what happens with leopards, and it's very different strategies for raising male cubs as it is to raising female cubs. So female leopards will put a lot more time and effort into a male cub than a female cub, and there's a couple of important reasons for this. So with female cubs, they generally become independent much younger than the males, so they're not reliant on mum uh, from anything from a year to a year and a half, whereas the males will hang around for sometimes over two years. Now, what will happen with a female cub is that the mother will basically shrink her territory size and give the female cub uh, a really good part of her territory. Now, what this does is it enables her to start off with a much better chance of survival, not having to immediately go to battle with uh, a, an adult female leopard who could be quite, quite, well, versed and experienced in fighting. So what happens is the female actually push herself into a slightly more marginal area. And uh, you'll notice female leopards, as they get older, their territories shrink, 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 and their daughters take over. So when it comes towards the end of a female leopard's life, she is inhabiting a very tiny territory and generally not the best territory. So very interesting that's so why she gives the better areas to her kids. Now that's with females. So with males, it's slightly different. The reason they put more time and effort into males is that uh, that is their best chance of uh, spreading their genetic code over a much wider area. So those males will move away from the natal range. It also helps curb inbreeding. And those males will mate with multiple females over their lives. So there's going to be multiple lines of that genetic code going out into different females. Where there is with females, it's going to be one line of that genetic code for one individual. So one female has one, passes on one line of the mother's genetic code, where there is the male will pass, pass, pass off multiple uh, genetic codes over, over the years. Now, males also need to be a bit bigger and stronger when they disappear off into the, into the wilderness to become dispersal males. Uh, they're going to need to be a little bit bigger. They're going to need to fend for themselves a bit better. And they're also probably going to come into contact with other leopards, so they're going to have to be that bit bigger and stronger to be able to fight or run away uh, effectively, whereas the females have a relatively safe start to life in comparison to the males. Aha, so I think my original guess was correct that it was elephants. There is a, a problematic or naughty elephant bull at the moment. There we have two. One has got the hole in the ear, the one we know quite well. And then there's another one with a big rip in his ear, who's been mangling fences and chasing cars. So I think that noise which was probably heard, were, and he's in must, was that particular elephant maybe chasing others or even screaming and chasing zebra or wildebeest or anything. He is a particularly cantankerous gentleman. Uh, we might go have a look at him now, but we're not going to go very close to him at all. But I will show you some of his handiwork. But back onto, while well, we move slowly towards that area, back onto uh, leopards and leopard territories. So now, once the male has got sort of that four or five years old, maybe six, and he's challenged and successfully won uh, a territory and home range for himself to set up shopping with lovely ladies to mate with, etc. He will then, after being in the same place for about three or four years, he will shift his territory again 
Uh, and this is quite common in males, and this is his next shift. So he doesn't breed with, breed with his adult daughters. Uh, so very, very interesting stuff. Here is some of the elephant's handiwork. He decided he really wanted to see what was on the other side of the fence. So you can see that steel has literally been bent like a little, uh, what would you say, like a, a piece of... Licorice. Licorice, yes. Well done, Jim. That's lovely, lovely visual. So it literally bent the steel standards of the fence like a piece of licorice. Yes. Unlike licorice, he will not be eating the fence. He's gone inside to see if there's anything nice to eat inside there. And obviously, he, he's found stuff because he's done it about four or five times now. Now, there we go. You can see he's bent the fence. Um, there's multiple places where he is bent. We're just going to give you a quick view of him from a distance before we go across to Jamie, who's got some probably far more uh, civilized elephants. So we're not going to get too close to him. He is very, very cheeky. There he is. You can see Big adult bull, he isn't full much, you're not going to go any closer. And, and so I'm just going to jump across to Jamie now. I'm just going to have to let everyone in the lodge know just to be careful that the cheeky Ellie is still around. Now, you can see there's very, he's already just spotted us and now he's on his way. So we're going to get out of here before he gets here. Uh, so let's go see Jamie. So we are with the herd of elephants that I strongly suspect is responsible for the peculiar sounds emanating from the Juma Dam camera. Now the reason we are so far away is that even though they are perfectly relaxed, I think that they have been harassed by that particular bull. We've got quite a few of them moving through this area following a female. And it's a female with a snared trunk, but I don't think it's the female that we've usually seen. So she has half a trunk, almost. It's less than the female that we've usually been watching. And in fact, we've got some large bulls moving down the road towards us as well. And I think there's just a little bit of upset in the elephant world. Lots of bulls gathering together, a lot of them fairly large. And that's why I'm giving the elephants as much personal space as possible. I noticed when we first parked off here that all of the elephants walking past us were streaming from their temporal glands, the females, which immediately tells me that they have been stressed out this morning. So I just wanted to show you them. We're not going to linger. We're not going to try and get any closer. We're just going to let them go about their daily business. They're not in any way bothered by us. It's something really nice to see that we're not having an effect on them and that, in fact, it's probably that bull or a couple of the bulls that are harassing. It does occasionally happen. You get groups of males moving together in a bachelor herd. They find a female or group of breeding herd and they just stick with them a little bit too much. The females get upset. They've got youngsters with them. They might not be an estrus and they might not appreciate the attention being drawn to them. I'm going to try and just reposition just change our direction that we're facing. Now, a lot of what we do, almost the most important, I would say, part of what we do, and we're going to stop here and we're going to wait for this female to come out, if she does come out into the open. A lot of, most, one of the most important aspects of what we do is actually reading elephant body behavior or body language. Now, they use that body language to communicate with other elephants. They also use it to communicate with us, and it's up to us to learn to read it. Do I think that I have a full grasp of every nuance of elephant communication? No, not at all. I've been watching documentaries on um, Joyce Poole, who was one of the, well, was the person responsible for the discovery that elephants actually communicate with that sub-frequency that we can't hear, and that they're capable, that sound is capable of traveling tremendous distances and I was watching her interpret an elephant's trunk twisting just twisting 
That was all it was doing. The elephant was standing completely still, doing that with the tip of its trunk. And she turned around and said, she's going to charge. And she did. In fact, the whole herd charged them. Look, it's a very different scenario. It was in Gorongosa in Mozambique, where the elephants had been plagued by civil war. Um, but to have that level is of, of insight into elephant behavior and body language is something that I absolutely aspire to. That being said, I do think I can read the basics fairly well. And you can, the elephants will tell you all that you need to know about them with their day-to-day -day life by just watching the various signs. Tail is important, head position is important, and the trunk is important. Those are the three main signs of what you're looking for. Sandra, you were wondering what does it mean when an elephant wags its ears or flaps its ears? If it's a slow, random movement every now and again, that's just the elephant being perfectly relaxed. It's the elephant cooling down. As you know, it's got that network of blood vessels within the very thin elephant ear that allows, as the air moves over it, it cools them down gradually as they wag them. The, if they turn around and they do this, ears out and hold, and they're looking at you, and it's usually accompanied by a head shake, that means one of two things, and you, you, there's a very subtle line between them. One is, I'm watching you, don't move, or don't come any closer, and one is, go away. And it's all about reading the body language together that actually really gives you that summation of what it is they are, what it is they want you to do. When an elephant walks down the road towards you like this, and with its tail wagging, steps nice and slow, that's absolutely fine. An elephant with a stiff tail or an upright tail, what we've noticed with our ripped ear elephant and with the elephant with a hole in his ear, they both display in the same way. They have their tusks obviously like that and they both put their trunks over like this and they rub up and down their tusks. Both of them do it and it's really, really interesting behavior. And that immediately to me now is a sign, is a new sign that I've learned that that elephant really does mean business when it comes to the presence of the vehicle. Actually, quite happy that she's there. Um, she's right sort of next to that tall tree on the left in the bushes, but moving away from us. Now, I'm going to let her just walk away from us. I mentioned that she had a, a half a trunk, and it's less than our female that we see regularly with about a third of her trunk missing, or about a quarter of her trunk missing. This elephant really is missing about half of its trunk. Now, an injury like that might have been from a crocodile. That is one possibility, but most likely, and very sadly, it was probably as a result of a snare that was set along the fence line for bushmeat by desperate people looking for food, and she got stuck in it, and it actually eventually got to the point where a snare, of course, being a piece of metal that tightened on the ends of their trunk. Now, it wouldn't have happened here. The Sabi Sands has got a tremendously good um, patrol and conservation strategy that ensures that that sort of thing doesn't happen. But as you know, we are completely unfenced and the borders of the park that we are in stretch all the way across to Zimbabwe and Mozambique. So it might have been something she acquired there. There she goes with the little one. She's also got a young baby. It's not, however, our snared trunk elephant. There's little one following her. And what I've noticed is that these snared trunk females are very often fairly separate from the main body of a herd. And what I noticed with her is that she snores constantly. And that's very clearly from the injury to her trunk. Shame, poor girl. But that being said, as sad as that is to see, she will be absolutely fine. She's more than capable of providing for herself and her little one. Look at all of the boys, sorry. Look at all the boys following her. <laughs> A trio of trouble there. A lovely sighting, an important sighting, one that makes me a little bit sad. But nevertheless, to know that she's okay and that she's healthy is, and that she will be fine. She's obviously been healthy enough to produce offspring. She's been healthy enough to maintain a pregnancy to full term and now look after a little one. Definitely is of huge comfort. We're gonna leave them now. We're going to continue on and see what else we can find. I'm going to go in the opposite direction to the sort of, what did we call him? 
the slit-eared elephant or the cut-eared elephant. We'll go see what else we can find. Maybe even return back towards to Cheetah Cutline. Earup Ellie. That's quite a good name. We'll just give him a wide berth since Brent is there keeping an eye on him and making sure that he doesn't continue on his... Um, I wouldn't call it a trail of destruction, just his minor temper tantrum at the moment. Bye-bye, Elias. Right, I'm going to go back to my original plan of the eastern boundary and cheetah cut line, see what else we can find there. In the meantime, let's get an update from Brent. Mr. Monkey. So, another reason, if there had been a predator around and that noise that you guys heard over the Juma camp, would have, these guys would have been shouting. And they're quite chilled, quite quiet. And they were out. Some of them are out, were out in the open on the grass of quarantine. They just popped up the tree as we drove past. See, there was a mom with a baby, but she scampered off quite quickly. <laughs> I do love vervet monkeys. They are. Oh, there's another animal on the road. A fierce creature known as the bush squirrel. Again, we would be hearing a lot of noise from them as well. If uh, there had been a predator around. So we're going to head back towards the northwest. Uh, maybe Shadow decided to come back from Sibambili to visit us. Normally, they pair off sort of in December. But because of the lack of rain, they haven't. But now they have, and you can see them feeding off all the grass seeds. And they might have babies after all this year, just quite late in the season. Now, so it's very common to just see two together at the moment, because they are a breeding pair, and when the dry season comes, they start forming large flocks. And obviously, ecstatic with the, the flush and all the grass seeds around, they're making short work of that digitile finger grass that they're feeding off. They're called finger grass because it looks like fingers. You can see it there. And they'll be feeding off a host of different grass species. Let's leave the little pair to carry on, and we're going to do the same. Very, very difficult to tell the difference between the sexes. Let's see if we can get a little bit closer, maybe, before we head on. Feeling a bit shy. Okay, so let's carry on. Uh, we're going to head towards uh, Sydney's waterhole in that area. Who knows, maybe we'll find some lion tracks as well. So there's almost zero difference between the 
the sexes of guinea fowl. So very, very difficult uh, when they're not in hand to see what they are. Uh, they have been domesticated in certain parts of the, the world and, and there is actually a, a market for guinea fowl meat. So they can be treated very much like chickens and often kept in the same coop as chickens. Now in rural Tanzania, the young herd boys who are looking after the cattle and goats will often, if they find small guinea fowl chicks, grab them and then rear them so they feed and become very much like a chicken. Now, one of the problems, or not a problem, but what, what does happen with that is quite often they do get a bit of inbreeding in the guinea fowl and you get some very interesting color morphs coming through. So a lot of leucism with, uh, that comes through it's a, with a genetic mutation and the lack of pigment. So I've seen quite a lot of white guinea fowl. Don't fly, don't fly. He's gonna fly. Oh, he's gonna fly. <laughs> there we go, a crested barbet. He was right next to, next to us, but he, he didn't have the nerve to hold his spot before disappearing off. question about female leopards, specifically mother and daughter. I'm just trying to remember who it was from. Just give me half a second. It was from Mimi, who's 15 years old. And do mother and daughter leopards fight? Or do they understand that they're mom and daughter? So what happens with leopards, they're a very solitary cat, apart from when they've got young cubs or mating they will often, so often those territorial boundaries between mother and daughter are quite common. So there will be a vague bit of tolerance, so less likely to sort of plunge into a full fight. So a lot of uh, scent marking, calling, snarling, growling, and we have seen that between Shadow and Karula before. But I think if push came to shove, uh, there would actually be a physical fight and uh, they are defending their now home range. And you must remember, they probably don't have the same sort of memory as uh, what we do. So there will be some form of sort of genetics, a genetic code and instinctive response that will try and uh, stop that fighting. But uh, I don't think it will hold out, specifically as the female or the mother gets older. Uh, that the daughter might look to extend her territory into the mother's old territory. So there, there are records of females having proper fights, uh, related females having proper fights, and the same would probably go for sisters. So once they are independent and adult, and especially if it's been sort of three or four or even five years since they've been spending a lot of time together, there is a possibility that a mother and daughter will fight. Oh, thanks, Mimi. That's a lovely question, continuing on the, the discussion we've been having about how different leopard territories work between males and females. So having a look at poultry, and that's guinea fowl, Clayton's wondering, are there any turkeys in South Africa? And uh, Clayton, there are, but they will be domesticated. So uh, it will be one of the turkey species, I guess, from the US. Uh, so we don't have any indigenous turkey species. Uh, the closest we've got to a turkey would probably be that guinea fowl we just saw. We do have bustards that are quite big, but not quite the same as the turkey. Ostrich, there you go. Liam says uh, the African turkey is an ostrich. 
And you might think a ground hornbill is like a turkey, but not at all. A uh, completely different family and a completely different uh, way of life uh, and feeding patterns. But a ground hornbill is a similar size to a turkey. Siberia, one of our zoomies said her father actually had a couple of guinea fowl. He used to raise them to try to keep the tick low down, so they will eat ticks when they are out in the grassland. But they pre definitely prefer grass, and Siberia says she's eaten quite a lot of guinea fowl meat. Now, I've got a fantastic recipe for guinea fowl, and it's quite a common one out here. So what you do is you have a plucked guinea fowl, and you put it in a tin foil, uh, with a lot of butter and garlic and lemon, or whatever herbs and spices you prefer. Now, you then wrap it. You can either put it in an oven or on a, in a fire in the coals itself. And you cook it for about two hours. And after that, you take out the guinea fowl, put it in the dustbin, and uh, beat the tin foil. Now, guinea fowl is quite a tricky meat to cook. It needs a lot of time. So generally, in my experience, the best way to enjoy a guinea fowl is in a casserole and cooked for eight, nine hours. Otherwise, the meat can be very rubbery and tough. Question from a final control from Louise. He wants to know uh, if it's true that guinea fowl can only be caught or eaten at certain times of the year because at other times they carry a parasite. Well, all pretty much every single bird out here is going to carry a parasite or might, and I don't think it makes a difference what time of the year. But a few years ago there was a a virus that really whacked the guinea fowl populations in South Africa called Newcastle's disease. Uh, very strangely, it affected two species very heavily and very unrelated species. One was the guinea fowl and the other was hyrax or dussies. And those populations plummeted. Since then, it seems like the Newcastle virus has just dissipated and the populations are returning quite quickly and building to be healthy again. Well, Jeffrey in Austin says his family used to raise chickens and they had a few guinea fowls. But Jeffrey had a rare breed of cannibalistic chicken because it killed the guinea fowls and then ate them. Now, I'm not sure why that would have happened. Uh, it could be a competition for food is the most likely explanation for that. But very, very interesting, Jeffrey. I haven't actually heard of that. I know lots of people who raise both successfully without too much violence. So you see, guinea fowl even made it all the way to Texas. Now, another one of our, our African birds, or we actually have a few African birds that are now localized in the United States. One is the cattle egret. Uh, it was brought out in this big misnomer that it was, its, its name was a tick bird. So it was brought out to the, the big cattle ranches to try to control ticks. Now, interesting enough, the cattle egret, even though its nickname is a tick bird, doesn't eat ticks at all. Uh, it actually eats other insects. And the reason it's found around buffalo and cows and elephants and that is it's actually just feeding off the insects that have been disturbed by, uh, by the animals moving through the grassland. So uh, I will show you a picture of it now. But there is another bird in Texas that is farmed from Africa. And actually, there are more of those birds in Texas than there are 
in the whole of Africa. And I wonder if you can guess which bird that is. Um, if you know the answer to that, drop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use uh, the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. But in the meantime, let's show you what the tick bird looks like, uh, the cattle egret. There we go. That is it in, let me just find the right place for it there, in breeding plumage. And so I think I actually saw some of them in Florida as well, and that's what it looks like in non-breeding plumage. They get that sort of a rufous coloration when they are in breeding colors. But yeah, highly localized in the United States. I did see them when I was in Florida. They're very, very interesting. And uh, with a lot of invasive and problematic species has all been moved by people. Uh, and here we don't have too many uh, animals that have taken root but we do have huge problems with certain invade, invasive plant species. Not in the Sabi Sands in particular, but in outlying areas. Well, at least the Ellies are out and about this morning. It doesn't seem to be much else. I mean, we've barely seen an Impala. Maybe Sydney's waterhole is going to change our luck. We're about to arrive. Okay, we're about to peer around the corner. Viam, what do you think we got there? Uh, I'm, I can see a squirrel so far. Uh, Viam can see a squirrel. Uh, I'm hoping maybe for a giraffe, uh, but I think. I've got a sneaky suspicion there's going to be nothing. As we peer around the corner, there is water buck in the distance. And that is all that is happening at Sydney's at the moment. There we go. A little water buck and an adult water buck lying on the edge of it a water hole. Okay, so we're going to continue our search for other fascinating creatures. While we do that, let's go see what Jamie's up to. Look what we have. Speaking about fascinating creatures, a very tiny, very fluffy pavy kudu. And the rest of them appearing through the bushes, or they were peering through the bushes. They've decided that I'm not of any kind of threat. Hello, little one. One of the ones that we've seen born over the last few weeks, not the birth per se, but we've definitely seen them very, very new. Look how much fluffier the calf is compared to mom, including the tail, presumably for extra insulation, although you'll find that with most young antelope, the youngsters are a bit fluffier than the, than the adults. We'll try to get another view, just to try and see if we can't get a clearer one. Oh, little one's looking back at us. We have returned, by the way, to Cheetah Cutline, now checking very carefully for any tracks of Tingana crossing back in. Hopefully bringing Tundi with him as well. Hello, ladies. Oh, you are... This is a very different... different style that we have going on here since the rain. To try and show you animals hiding in the trees. I'm going to try and find a gap. Ooh. <laughs> Through the bushes. How's that, Dave? Yeah, that's good. It's about as, I think, as clear as we're going to get. And see the baby at the back there with very distinctive stripes. Oh. Watching these kudu 
to me one of the most graceful and attractive little antelope that we can find out here. We've also seen in Yana the slightly smaller cousin of the kudu. Joey was wondering about which antelope species we could find on Juma, including the rare ones. Joey, that's a really nice question. We've actually tried to count them before. I can't remember what the total was, though. I always forget. But what I'll do is we'll go very quickly through my book and we'll talk about, since our kudu have moved off, we'll talk about which antelope species we could see here, starting with the blue wildebeest, which we've seen regularly. That's one. And let's go to the next page. You see mm, red heart beast, unlikely. So we won't count that one. Definitely not seeing Bontebok or Blessbok. They're in the Cape. That's what a Blessbok looks like, by the way. But that's not one we would see here. Okay, next one that we could see and that I have actually seen in the Kruger, a Tsesebe. An extraordinary antelope, the fastest antelope species that we could see out here with the most incredible stamina. You can see with those powerful front shoulders and sloped back, that almost immediately tells you that whatever animal you're looking at, whether it be an antelope or a predator, is built for stamina and speed rather than stealth like, for example, the spotted hyena. What was that? Number two. You're unlikely to see the red or the blue dacre. They much prefer the forested areas, but a grey dacre is number three, one that we most definitely could see and do regularly see. Number four. Oof, uh, could we see them on Juma? Probably not because of the lack of rocky outcrops, so we won't count that one, although the clipspringer do occur here funny little rock climbing antelope very i hope that somebody somewhere is keeping count an oribi is unlikely a steenbok regularly seen dave any idea what number we're on five i think that's four four <laughs> sorry you guys can keep count there i'll just i'll be in charge of finding you the antelope <laughs> and the Impala, number five-ish, I think. Roan, we could see, and there are in fact specific, or there were in fact specific breeding camps within Kruger in order to rescue these incredibly endangered antelope from extinction. They are now safely back. Could we see them? Yes, we could. Have we seen them? No, we haven't. But we can always keep our, our fingers crossed for a sighting of one. You know what? The elephant herd has come to listen. Let's just have a look quickly. We'll go back to the question, but the elephant herd has come to say hello. They also want to listen on the antelope species of the area. Hello, Elise. Yes, you can come. All right, let's get back to this quickly. Sable, that appeared on the Juma Dam camera for the first time in 17 years, a couple of weeks ago. We didn't get to see him, unfortunately, but he is possibly around. Okay. Hemsbok, no. Buffalo, yes, but that's not an antelope. Whoa. Kudu are on the list. We've just had a look at them. Sitatunga, we'd be very lost, so no to the Sitatunga. The Anyala and the Bushbuck, both antelope that we could see here. Now, there's one that I haven't quite got to that I am desperate to get to because we could see one here, and in fact, Brent did see one. Elant, the largest antelope of the spiral-horned antelope family, so the larger cousin of the kudu and the inyala. We could see as well, but unlikely. They prefer the sort of more arid areas in the northern parts of Kruger. This is a southern reedbuck. Now, we could see them here, they prefer the sort of grassland areas. And reedbuck, as the name suggests, also enjoy river and sort of high grassland vegetation or reeds, essentially. So that's one that I haven't seen. I'm not sure if anybody's seen them on the live shows. If some of our regular viewers who've been watching for many years could let me know if you've ever seen a southern reedbuck. Somehow I doubt it, but I'm not 100% certain, so let me know if you've ever seen a southern reedbuck. That is a very rare one. 
that we would get exceptionally excited about, as would be the southern mountain reedbuck, also within our range. But again, also not all that likely. So keep your eyes peeled for those. Grey reebok, unlikely. Waterbuck, we definitely see plenty of. Lechwe, definitely not. Those are in Botswana. Pukus, definitely not. And there we come to the end of the antelope species that we could see in that area. So a very thorough answer. I've lost track. I can't remember exactly how many I went through. Unfortunately, my elephants found my antelope lesson exceptionally boring and have disappeared. That's quite sad. And there you go. That's all of the antelope that you could expect to see whilst on safari with us. There is one missing from that list, and I don't know how I missed the page in my book. There is one missing that I didn't talk about, and let's see if you can guess which one it is that I'm thinking of. It is the smallest antelope that we could see in this region. The smallest antelope, very similar in shape and size to a Steenbok and a Dacre. I wonder what that could be, Dave, do you know? I think it might. Mm -hmm. I saw one recently in a Kruger. I know, I've said bushbuck. Something smaller, and I have yet to see one on Juma, but they do exist out here. I saw one in Kruger recently. Brent and myself saw one outside Olifants, along with a Clipspringer, by the way. But we actually reported the sighting of this little antelope. Similar in size and shape to a Steenbok. Let's see if you can figure out which particular antelope I'm talking about. That's wonderful news. Joshua's son, Jaden, is watching for the first time. Hello, Jaden. Welcome to the Sunrise Safari. I hear that you absolutely love elephants. Me too. And we started off the morning so wonderfully with such a beautiful elephant sighting. Now, just to let you know why I can't get any closer to these guys, we're sitting right on our eastern boundary. And so I am not allowed to drive on that particular part of the land. But nevertheless, a, a pleasure and a privilege to see them. And we've had lots of elephants this morning on our sunrise safari. So welcome, Jaden. I hope you stay with us and keep watching. Every day, time to see, time to see the one which is where I was born and grew up, where my parents still live city I know very well. Last view of our elephants. Just looking at the one in the back there before they move off and we do too. Okay. Just hidden and dark grey shapes melting into the bush. Isn't it amazing how a couple of tons of animal can disappear not, not even 50 meters away from us. That's how thick and dense this vegetation has got since the rain. And it's so wonderful grazing again. It's been a long time since we've seen them actively feed the grass. So, hey, I'm just causing a bit of a traffic jam here. Yeah, I'm just going to let them go past. So, I saw where Shadow crossed in. Uh, but, or crossed out, sorry, should I say, into Sibambili. So, we're going to move on. 
We're gonna go see what's happening around the Impala Plains and that area, see if we can find anything there. We do apologize for the gremlins uh, with Jamie at the moment. I wonder how long that poor man was sitting behind us while I was looking for tracks. Nice track going across the road here. There we go. And I always stop to check to see if it's a drag mark. In this case, it's a rock monitor crossing the road. So we have a few answers to the bird quiz. And Jeffrey says grey heron. Jeffrey, that is an Excellent answer, and there are quite a lot of grey herons in the United States, except they are indigenous to the United States. It is one of the bird species that occurs on most of the major continents, so through Europe, Africa, and the States. I'm not 100% sure about the East or Australia, but they are naturally occurring in the States, but that's a very good answer. It is one bird species we have in both places. Uh, Ellen says wild turkeys. I'm afraid uh, we don't have any wild turkeys indigenous to Africa. So the wild turkeys in Texas are probably bigger and better than everywhere else in America, but they are still Texan. So we'll give you a little bit longer, see if anyone else can come up with the correct answer. So, well done to Judy and Shannon, who have got it spot on. There are more ostriches in Texas than there are in Africa. Uh, they are farmed there for their meat, a very healthy option, uh, very little fat on their meat. So. There are many ostriches in the great state of Texas. So let's go have a look what's happening on Impala Road, Impala Plains. It looks like, unfortunately, Shadow has departed but I think we're gonna go try and find you some birdies this morning let's do a bit of bird watching it is quite a nice cool morning so we should get some interesting birds hopefully one or two that can be added to your bird lists I know there's some seriously impressive bird lists out there well over 200 so let's keep it going As far as I'm aware, Mike in Florida is top of the pops. I know he's got, I think, around 230 or 240 different bird species seen on the live drives. And wouldn't it be fantastic if I could also add a new bird to my bird list? And that doesn't happen too often in this part of the world. We're chatting about cooking wild fowls like guinea fowl, and X Ranga said his tip uh, to get them soft and succulent is uh, to soak them in brine overnight before cooking. Well, not a bird, but very beautiful indeed. 
the anthericum flowers. Not too much to say about them. There's no real... Let's jump across to Jamie. She's got something very interesting. Oh, there's only one bird of prey that sits up like that with such a fluffy head. See that upright, really upright posture? And that is a brown snake eagle. And it is a brown snake eagle that has made all of the squirrels in the vicinity absolutely furious because of its presence. I can hear them cackling away. That was my worst squirrel impression. Squirrels furiously shouting at me. What the snake eagle? It's amazing what the alarm calls. I'm going to sit here for a second and just listen to try and see if I can start memorizing what a squirrel sounds like when it sees a snake eagle. I'm going to follow Renius's techniques. I don't know, Renius speaks squirrel. Renius, of course, being the master tracker that came to give us some lessons. To me, that squirrel alarm call sounds very similar to any other squirrel alarm call I have ever heard. A little bit difficult to identify the difference. Maybe a bit more frantic. Snake eagle, not bothered at all, but surveying the area below him with keen, keen eyesight. Birds have far better eyesight in a lot of respects than humans do. Particularly for raptors, their binocular vision, which makes sense because if you're going to come plummeting out of the sky in order to catch a snake or something similar, you definitely want to be able to judge that distance as well as possible. Uh, this bird sits without any feathers on his legs. That's another adaptation to his hunting method. As you know, true eagles do not or have feathers all the way down to their feet, whereas a snake eagle has bald legs. And the theory behind that is that it allows him to, or her, to watch exactly and make sure that their legs land exactly where they mean to, whilst dodging the strikes of a snake trying to defend itself. That's what makes them such specialized snake hunters. It's a very agile bird. That squirrel is still furious. Not only do birds have the exceptional eyesight in that respect in order to be able to determine distance and sort of three-dimensional proprioception, but also... Oh! <laughs> That was very brave. I couldn't even see what bird species. I think those were helmet shrikes that attempted to dive bomb that eagle there. They are now sitting. If we just have a look in the thorn tree, if we go down to the left a little bit. Here we go, that tree that's just come into frame now. Where'd they go? Here they are fluttering about. It's the white crested helmet. Oh, he's up. There's another squirrel alarm calling. Well done, Dave. Excellent. Now, we've got some answers to our antelope quiz. Vancey has said the reedbok, which was apparently seen on in coral recently. I think I said reedbok before, although you are right, that is one that we would get very excited about seeing. Uh, Peggy and Chris Rogue have mentioned the dictic. It's not the one that we could see here. A dictic is a tiny little antelope, absolutely. You are correct, but if we have a look I've got my page open on the answer, so you can't see that right now. <laughs> Where's the dictic? Just have a look at the dictic's home range. 
You do get some of them in South Africa, but so the map is not 100% accurate, but definitely an animal adapted for a, a more arid area. So their main population is around Namibia. So a little Damara dictic, and I know that um, Scott spoke about them at great length. He, he once found himself in possession of one, which is a very entertaining story, but unfortunately I don't know the details well enough to relate it, but that's what a dictic looks like. So a good answer in that it was the little antelope species, but I'm thinking more about a little antelope that we could see here, the smallest antelope we could see here, and one that we haven't seen as far as I know, but that we could. I'm going to find the answer again, put it down. Yeah, baby. there we go. Well done to Joey and Raisa and James, all saying the correct answer. A sharps chreisbok. A funny, tiny little creature. Now, this, this drawing doesn't fully give the impression of just how mottled they look. They look like a steenbok that's aged and gone sort of salt and pepper gray with age. Those, that white along their fur comes through very, very clearly. So it looks very similar in size and shape to a steenbok, but a slightly more rounded, curved back, even more so than a steenbok. There is another chreisbok species, which is why the best answer was Sharp's chreisbok, and that's the Cape chreisbok, although I think one that has wandered along to here would be very lost indeed, and perhaps in need of a map, because they belong, as the name suggests, in the southwestern portion of our country. Well done, guys. The Sharps Graceful. I can promise you now, if either Brent or myself ever come across them, or any of the guides and presenters, you are going to be seeing a great deal of excitement from us. We will be jumping up and down in happiness. to Anna. Anna was wondering what the difference is between an antelope and a gazelle. And the answer is, Anna, gazelles are a type of antelope. So they fall within... Antelopes are divided into, we call them families colloquially, it's actually tribes. So the small horned antelope is a tribe. The dakers or the, the small antelopes being part of the same tribe and so on. So gazelles, Thompson gazelles, etc., form part of the part of their own tribe, very closely related to something like a springbok. But we don't we don't have any gazelle species in South Africa. Thompson's gazelles, of course, being the sort of East African, Tanzania, Kenya side. It's essentially almost this is a bizarre comparison, but it's the first one that popped into my head. It is like comparing, or it's like the difference between frogs and toads. Toads are part of, are a family within the frog sort of overarching connective title. So that's the way, <laughs> I don't know why all of a sudden I'm comparing frogs to antelope, but I assume that you, you get the general gist of things. It's like those IQ questions about all mumples or wimbles, but so only some wimples or mumbles or whatever it is. You know, the, you get the idea of what I mean. At least I hope you do, because otherwise that entire sentence made absolutely no sense. <coughs> and a warm welcome to Lisa, who is watching in Minnesota. And Lisa has joined us for the very first time and is loving the live stream and enjoying all of the different animals that the reserve has to offer her. But Lisa wants to know, do we ever get jaguars in this area? And the answer, Lisa, is no, we don't. We don't get jaguars, although we get the very close relative to them, the leopard. Now, leopards, in terms of body structure, are slightly smaller, not quite as stocky as a jaguar. Jaguars are pretty much isolated to the, the 
the South American areas. I know that that one Jaguar was seen further north in the US as well. I can't remember his name now. I know one of the viewers kindly sent me that, that article on the, the Jaguar that was seen further north of its usual range. And I know he was spotted in Texas. But no, unless you're in a zoo, Lisa, you won't be seeing a Jaguar. But you will be, you could well see their closest relative, or one of their closest relatives, which is a leopard. Now we've got two big members of that family, the lion and the leopard, falling part of the Panthera family. Jeepers, did you see that? <laughs> An ox picker panicked. <laughs> he flew into my head. <laughs> Sorry, that's the first time that's ever happened to me. I promise you I turned my head and it was, it was this close to my nose. <laughs> that is definitely a first. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm really glad I'm not afraid of birds. <laughs> that's never ever happened to me before. <laughs> I wonder who got more of a fright, the ox picker or me? <laughs> That's a new one. That was so close, I promise you he turned here, right next to my head. I had a very good view of the underside of their tail, by the way, as he banked up and over my head. Oh, that was hilarious. Sorry, I, I completely ignored the fact that there's an entire herd of impala that just dashed across the road. <laughs> Ah, oh, it was El Jefe, the Jaguar. Thank you very much, ladies in final control, providing me with that answer. El Jefe, the Jaguar that was seen in Texas. Hopefully there's more than that. You know, I'm not sure exactly how it works with Jaguars, but leopards, their, their close relative leopards are extraordinary in their ability to move about undetected. And a good example of that was one that was living in the Ellis Park Stadium in Johannesburg for many years, as well as in an abandoned block of flats in Pretoria. So, despite the fact that we think our cities are sterilized of wildlife, even in the largest cities of South Africa, there are still leopards. And in fact, there's a strong suspicion that the leopards move about fairly regularly, particularly in an area known as Randburg or around there, as well as a bit further to the Machalisberg mountain range. And it's thought that the, the leopards do often regularly move down from the mountains and into the cities. There was, of course, speaking about Randburg, um, there was, of course, the famous story of the brown hyena that wandered into Blegari and was photographed wandering down the road. Uh, you must understand that for city dwellers in Johannesburg, this comes as quite the surprise, until a research organization chimed in and said, guys, that family of hyenas, there are multiple families of brown hyenas living in Johannesburg, and in fact, one of them dens in one of the largest motorway junctions in Joburg, and in fact, probably in South Africa, an area known as the Galulis Interchange. They were denning there for many, many years until the roadworks actually caused them to relocate. So, might not just be one Jaguar wandering through Texas, you never know. And then, of course, there's always those mystery sightings of the big cats in the UK. The last one I heard about was a stuffed toy tiger that was hidden in a park. Luckily, animal control was straight on the scene, ready to respond with their dart guns, only to realize it was one of those giant stuffed tigers. Uh, that's always the possibility. There's also the big cat that has been seen in Cambridge many times. The only thing I ever saw in Cambridge while I was there was some muntjac deer and a fox or two and a barn owl that scared me by screeching outside my window. Oh, sorry. Um, it was not, Al Jefe was not in Texas, it was in Ariz, he was in Arizona that it was spotted. So thank you to Melissa and many others who've let me know. 
Sorry, it was an article that I read and then the info just... I, I got the basic gist of it and then forgot about the sort of crucial parts of the information. Hello, Impala. All keeping a very close eye on us. The Impala this morning came closest to causing me serious injury by running away and dislodging the ox pickers that were sitting and feeding on their backs and eating the food. I wonder what would have happened if that bird had collided with my head. I wish you could have seen it. It must have looked hilarious. The two of us got such a fright at each other at the same moment. I really thought he was going to fly into my head. I think that probably would have been highly entertaining for you all. <laughs> Trauma. <laughs> oh, goodness. I'm not going to forget that for a very long time. It's the last time I approach Impala with a feeling of complete confidence. Now, speaking about birds and the fact that, thank goodness, I'm not afraid of them, Monkey Man was wondering what my favorite bird is in the sands. Ooh, goodness me, that's a difficult question. What is my favorite bird? I really like the little owl species. I really enjoy the scops owls and the pearl spotted owls, even the barred owlets whenever we do get to see them. And I don't quite know why. I think it's just their, their constantly indignant expression amuses me no end. I love the way they look at you. You've done them some enormous service. Um, what else do I do? The little brightly colored sunbirds I think are absolutely stunning. I've got very used to, I guess I take for granted the rollers and the kingfishers. Pygmy kingfishers I do really enjoy. Could it be a Sharps Facebook? Probably not, but we'll just stop and say hello to it anyway. It is not a Sharps Facebook, it is a Stian book. But you never know. It would have been highly appropriate if we'd spent the morning talking about it, and it had been. Is that, oh, there goes number two. <laughs> and off they dash together living and foraging together in monogamous pairs, which is why you so often see both of them together. Although I have to confess, that one that dashed across the road, I think, was a youngster living with its mom. It looked a bit tinier. The one that stayed looking at us was a female, an adult female. The females don't have horns. The males do have tiny little dagger-like horns. I've never seen a steenbok or a male steenbok fight, but I do feel as though it would be very interesting to witness. I can imagine that they were about a baby. Oh, cute. I've got to stop here. It's going to... Oh, it's running away. It was a little baby. It's still book. No, no, it's fine. It just dashed off so quickly. Okie dokie. Guys, we're going to go quite fast through this area just because my signal's breaking up but Brent is busy tracking on foot. So we're going to go very rapidly that way where we did have good signal this morning. We're not far. Oopsie daisy. We'll dodge the steer monkey. to an area where we had perfect signal this morning with the elephants. There we go, that's a bit better. Right, before I got distracted by our little steering book, we were talking about favorite birds. And I was just saying that I think I've started taking kingfishers and rollers for granted, even though they are so incredibly attractive. Oh look, and it's our elephant herd again. better than an elephant themed sunrise safari, except maybe an elephant themed sunset safari. Hello guys. Some young bulls straggling at the back of this herd. He's about to get across with me. 
just that slight weariness, that slight turn of the head that he displayed. I think that they've been scuffling this morning. He's also secreting from his temporal glands. Now, young males like this, as the same with the females, it's usually a sign of some kind of heightened emotion, whether it's anxiety or happiness or playfulness. Maybe some play got a little bit too rough. Let's just sit nice and quietly. There's another one that's going to come right up to us. Hello, girls. How is it? I'm just going to sit here nicely. Hello, you. Hello, little boy. Oh, so many balls. Straggling at the back. Hello, gorgeous. You're going to be a big boy when you're older. Still very young, haven't got the rounded forehead of a mature adult elephant. Yeah, speaking nice and softly. Isn't that a nice sighting? <laughs> As I said, they're, whilst not cross with us, they've just sprinted back behind me and run off down the road. I'm not going to follow them. I think they've had quite a few vehicles passing through this area and they want to be on their own. The young bull particularly showing signs of stress. Let's just carry on. We'll see what other things we bump into. While we do that, Marianne's asked a question about elephant feeding, and we spoke this morning at length about the way in which they feed on plant matter and how incredible it is that they get big on that kind of food, on that kind of diet. And Marianne was wondering, well, how do they get calories and the proteins that they need and the nutrients that they need? So there's a type of tree in terms of, let's talk about the nitrates first and the proteins. Acacia trees are what, what are known as nitrogen fixers. Now, elephants don't need, and in fact, people actually, to be completely honest, don't need huge amounts of proteins in order to function. Your lifestyle is, you do need it though, in your diet. Trees known as nitrogen fixers. Nitrogen fix, fix, fixers have special bacterial capsules on systems known as rhizomes. Rhizomes play a role in converting the nitri nitrites into soil into usable nitrates that the plant can then utilize as part of their growth and as part of their need because every living organism needs protein to an extent it's part of DNA it's part of a lot of um, cell walls etc so they do need it and of course proteins are enzymes or enzymes are proteins you need to be able to cook the plants in living organisms their metabolic processes are catalyzed by enzymes which are first of all an unending life cycle so they need to be constantly produced now, any organism needs proteins and that's where the elephants get theirs from from eating the plants and from eating plant, plant leaves and tubers vitamins and minerals most of them come from themselves and especially if the trees are fruiting, you'll notice the elephants particularly enjoy the marula fruit, which has high contents of vitamin C. But of course, in winter, when that's not possible, they will practice a process known as geophagy, which is when they go and they lick or eat parts of the soil <coughs> that contain the nutrients that the elephants are elephants very, very well adapted at finding the nutrients that they want to utilize. Same goes for all of our animals. Now, I'm sure you are as curious as I am as to what a Brent was tracking on foot. I think I know, I think I heard the update on the Game Drive channel, but I think that you should find out directly from him. 
So we found some adult male leopard tracks. Now, very interesting as to who it could be. Liam and I have been discussing it at length, and we think it's in Vula, just because of where Tingana was seen last night. And the tracks seem to be quite aimless, so not like a male leopard on patrol. So we're going to do another loop around here and see if we can find any more tracks. They are from early last night, so not the most fresh tracks, but still worth having a squiz. Mingus Dave is saying, well, is if the jaguar is a relative of the leopard, are there any relatives of the cougar in Africa? Well, relative is a strong word. They're, they're, they're under the same genus, but they've evolved separately. They probably have uh, a, 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 a single ancestor, but going back millions of years. But I wouldn't call them, they're not very closely related. Uh, and, and as in terms of a cougar or a mountain lion, if you actually had to compare, uh, they also, in terms of behavior, uh, size, etc., are very similar to leopard. Uh, they are, however, I don't think they are panthera, so they do not have that uh, oscillated, sorry, not oscillated, uh, that cartilaginous uh, hyoid bone that enables them to roar. So, uh, jaguars and, and leopards they are related, but sort of on the grand scale of relations uh, is the same as that all people are related. Um, or we are related to chimpanzees and gorillas. It's, 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 we are, but we're, we're not direct, re directly related. So, and in terms of a cougar, cougar is actually far more similar to a leopard uh, in terms of behavior, size and everything than uh, a, a jaguar. Uh, they do share similar traits, jaguar. Now, they do, they're both spotted cats, although the jaguar's markings are slightly different. Jaguar are much bigger than a uh, leopard, and they also are great swimmers, which a leopard is not. And a lot of people wonder why a jaguar is so much bigger than a leopard. Surely because of all the large, much larger prey in Africa, it would make more sense uh, for the leopard to be bigger. Well, not the case, really, because they've got lions to deal with out here. So you probably find the jaguar has become that size because there is no other real dominant predator to compete with them. So leopards, in terms of their survival strategy, have gone a, a bit smaller, a bit easier to sneak around, and and very solitary to avoid the social cat uh, being lions. So they don't want to get too big and too conspicuous. Whereas the jaguar doesn't have that issue. That's why they've probably got that much bigger than leopards have. And probably the same reason why the mountain lion has stayed a little bit smaller, try and avoid the jaguars, be more fleet of foot. We're just checking down the power lines here to see if that male leopard didn't pop out here. Maybe we might even check back towards Impala Plains again. Maybe we'll get lucky with some alarm calls. Shannon in Ohio is wondering, would a leopard ever get too old to climb a tree? Well, Shannon, it is possible in theory, but generally before they get too old to climb a tree at all, maybe not climb a tree very well, they will generally be killed by other predators, either by lion or hyena or even another leopard. It's very seldom uh, that anything outside of the really big animals like uh, rhino and elephant are probably the only two that will die of old age. 
but even then, they normally die from malnutrition. So they're not able to digest or, or feed as well as they would like. And uh, well, elephants in some cases, and rhinos actually, uh, when they get that old, they quite often die from drowning. Now, that sounds like quite a strange thing. So what quite often happens is when they do get to that very old, old age, they tend to try hang around a water hole or a permanent water source so they don't have to move too far to get water. And they just get too weak. And while they're at the water, they or pass out. They're unable to get up and, and they drown. Come on, Jim. Find him, Vula. I know he's one of your favorites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll find him. There we go. If he's here, Vim says he will find him. So Michael is saying that pumas, or mountain lions, or cougars, lots of different names for the same thing, are apparently more closely related uh, to the cheetah than uh, the leopard. And I'm not sure why. I, I'm not 100% convinced. I will, I will do some research on that. So. Is that what I think it was? Oh, you see him? No. Oh, no, that's out of tree now. No, no, in, in this tree? Yeah. In the center. We haven't seen one of those for a while. Let me just, there we, oh, we popped out. Uh, where'd he go? Uh, and a plum-colored starling. Very beautiful bird. Let's see if I can find him again for you. Oh, there, he's on the other side of this glory bush. There's a go-away bird in there as well. The quarries are busy fruiting at the moment. Attracting lots of birds. There he is, just below the go-away bird, Vim. So, oh, look at that beautiful coloring, that iridescence. And this is definitely one of the most striking starlings we get here. Now, that is a male. Where's he popped off to? There he is. So with the guari fruiting, it's attracting lots of different bird species. Now those little guari berries are very tasty. I snack on them from time to time when I find some ripe ones. There we go, look at that. Gorgeous bird. Looking for a ripe guari to eat. And cleaning the beak from the stickiness from this, the fruit. Oh. <laughs> Go away, birds making a fuss at the top, two fighting over their spot. I thought there might be some mouse birds. Well, well, the birds have flown off. Let's go have a quick look at the fruit, and then we're going to go see what Jamie's got. She has got something fascinating, a big business of fascinating things, or a large business taking the corporate world of the bush by storm. Let's have a look at, ooh, those, 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 those. ooh, let me go forward with it. They are looking like some, there's some nice ripe ones here. Come on, come on. Now, this one, you can see, I've just squashed it. You can see that juicy, juicy ripe little berry. Now, I don't want to pop the ones before I get to eat them. 
So you can see, there we go. And it's a, quite an interesting thing that quite a few tree species do. As you can see, they're not all ripening at the same time. So that's to ensure that they can attract birds and other things at different times. So those little three there look quite, oh, so ripe, Vim. Would you like one, Vim? There we go. Mmm. Sweet and succulent. Unfortunately, mm, not much flesh. Here we go. And then in the inside, that's what you get. Little pip, so mostly pip, not much, not much else. So now that large corporation that Jamie has will also feed off these fruits, but only the ones that have fallen to the ground. So let's go see what the corporation is up to. This is one of the coolest dwarf mongoose sightings I have ever had. There's at least 15 of them, all <laughs> situated in their termite mounds. This is one of the largest businesses of mongoose I have ever seen. Business, of course, being the proper collective noun. They're just everywhere in this termite mound. Every little hole I look at has a head curiously poking out at us. And it's amazing how much braver they've got while, just while we've been sitting here observing them. Initially, they were just noses and ears poking out. See if you can't. We'll start from sort of the far edge with that little guy. Let's count together. One, oh, two, <laughs> three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. And 14 that we can see, but I'm fairly certain that there's more in there as well. Look at that and stretching out there. Oh, no, stop now. Look how cute they are. So the smallest predator that you could see out here, a family of dwarf mongoose, one of only two sociable species of mongoose on the reserve, the other being the banded that we hardly ever see. And this grouping will be made up of one breeding pair, the alpha female and the alpha male. And the rest of these guys will be committed to, just like with wild dogs, committed to raising their babies and their babies alone. Look at them scurrying about. That constant little sense of curiosity and alertness happening. There's a couple of juveniles in this group, almost fully grown. Dwarf mongoose can grow relatively rapidly compared to other animals out here, so it only takes them about six months to reach adulthood. And the alpha female can breed about twice a year. They've probably had a bit of a lion this morning. <clears throat> and are only now, just now, coming out and basking in the sun and getting ready to forage. I'm just going to make a slight noise and just let's have a look at their reaction to it. variety of different alarm calls producing different responses. That last one that I did was a sort of general bird alarm call. You can see how they all didn't panic, but just tensed a little bit. They've got such a wide vocal range. Oh, something scared them and it wasn't me. And once again, we're starting with the heads popping out. And every now and again, very subtly, one dashes away from the termite mound and off to go forage. Donovan, I agree, I also love them. They are such sweet little things and highly entertaining to watch. I wish they
get to know the different mongoose groups. I've got a couple of friends who spend their day studying specific different families of dwarf mongoose. So unfortunately, it seems like Jamie's still got a few gremlins. Uh, hopefully they'll be sorted out shortly. We're just doing a big loop around this block where we saw those leopard tracks. And trying to see if they come out here. And those are hyena tracks. So there's a strong possibility that he's having a schnooze somewhere in this general vicinity. Didn't walk back out down here. Maybe he's got a meal in that block somewhere. So one of the things about when there's lots of water around that makes it quite difficult, apart from the difficulties of just seeing tracks, is uh, the fact that there's so much water. So when a leopard has a kill, and there's only certain water points they can go to. You'll often find the tracks to and from there. But at the moment, there's just puddles everywhere, so they don't have to move to and from the permanent water, which can make it a little bit more interesting, let's say, uh, to find them. helps to check in the big marula trees. So Victoria is spot on. Uh, puma are, are in their own family, the puma genus, and then obviously jaguar, uh, lion, leopard, tiger, are all in panthera, and cheetah is in asionics. So that's why I'm finding it difficult to say that a cheetah is more closely related to a puma, just because of where they evolved. Now. I didn't say earlier that uh, the puma and leopard were related. I just said they were more similar in behavior. Well, they are related. All the cats are related. They all do come from a common ancestor. But uh, in terms of behavior, uh, uh, size, uh, prey selection, etc., a puma is far more similar to a leopard than it is to a cheetah. And of course, it does have retractable claws. OK, so we've got no tracks coming out. This is where we were earlier. So he must be hiding in this thick block somewhere. And I think we'll definitely have to come back here on the Sunset Safari to investigate further. Hamza in Toronto is wondering how many prey species die of old age as opposed to being hunted. Well, in this part of the world, I would say almost none. Uh, everything is sort of hunted before they get to that age. As they start becoming slower and older, uh, they are generally picked off by the predators before they can sort of pass gracefully into the night. 
Occasionally, you will find the odd animal that has expired from old age, specifically around the lodges, and will normally be an anyala or a bushbuck. And even then, it's not from old age itself. Now, the older individuals that have managed to find homes inside the lodges, it's a little bit safer than out in the wilderness. Uh, they will quite often die at the first cold snap of winter. So just bodies aren't able to cope and they expire when we get that first really cold night. And it happens in areas without big numbers of predators, so game farms that don't have any predators. And uh, you see it with specifically in Anyala and Bushbuck and also zebra. And they can die from the cold as well. Now uh, on our on my family farm that we used to have when I was a kid in KwaZulu Natal. There, at the first sort of real snap of winter, and it's much colder than here, uh, and we only had, from large predators, we only had leopard. And when that first major cold snap happened, uh, we probably had about a hundred or so zebra on the farm, and every year, we'd lose about six or seven of the elder zebra to that cold snap. Thank you very much, Michelle in New Jersey, who's gone and found the big cat family tree. So cheetah, puma, and the jaguaruni, which is a small cat, all share a common ancestor, where there's the common, the panthera common ancestor, begot. Uh, of course, all the major panthera species, as well as snow and clouded leopard. So thank you very much for that, Michelle. So yes, cheetah, theoretically, way back when, are far more closely related to the puma than the leopard. So we're just double checking that the leopard didn't jink back towards this area. No one has driven here yet, so if there are any tracks, they should be nice and clear in the road. So it doesn't look like anything's around here. I wonder what the last few minutes of the Sunrise Safari will hold. And I can definitely say it's going to hold one big black backside. Maybe two big black backsides, three big black backsides. And some buffalo balls. Hello, mister. Having a good head scratch. There you go. So you often find branches broken like that, and a lot of people often incorrectly assume that it is from an elephant. And there you can see buffalo are quite adept at doing a bit of tree destruction themselves. Now it's got a bit warmer, and these buffalo are moving from the warm ground on top of the crest going to try find a nice wallow or pan to sleep in for the day and uh, ruminate. There we go. Hello, mister. Oh, we got a little family of oxpeckers on that buffalo. You can see the juvenile hasn't quite got the red beak yet.
Uh, these buffalo are on the march, and I'm pretty sure I know where they're going. There's a lovely little pan just up ahead. It's okay, old man. Let's not have a major panic. Oh, to you too. So we're talking about uh, that guinea fowl recipe, and I mentioned the throwing the bird in the dustbin. Uh, Deborah in Minnesota would like to know what a dustbin is. Well, um, in, if you're in the UK or England or or the old British colonies, a dustbin is a trash can. Uh, so that's what we call a trash can out here. So, <laughs> sorry about that. I must remember to use both uh, the North American and uh, British sayings for certain words, otherwise we can cause a little confusion. Andy and Julie in Los Angeles say, is there an equivalent to the Bigfoot myth in South Africa? Well, not quite the Bigfoot, um, but there is the myth of the Tokolosh, who is a water sprite. Uh, he is very, very short, but he has a very long um, appendage and he wraps around his waist and uh, it's said to live in sort of low-lying swampy areas and to be quite naughty and, and commit murders and that, except they have a great love of children and will never harm a children. But further north in Africa, there's a, a very similar uh, story to that, but I'll have to go into that a bit more detail on the Sunset Safari, if you guys remind me. It's called Kulikamba. So that is said to be a cross. Oh, there's a little Eastern red-footed kestrel. Oh, he's going very quickly. Oh, he disappeared. Um, but there we go. Thanks for joining us on the Sunrise Safari. Unfortunately, Jamie's still got gremlins, so I'm going to bid you adieu for her and for Dangerous Dave. But don't forget to join us for another riveting sunset safari as we go in search of all Africa's wonders. So from VM and myself, goodbye.